Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Veronica, thanks for having me, as always. Uh, this is actually kind of a perfect setting to uh, reflect on Joseph Cornell's life and work today. Uh, the really the uh, I think Cornell would be in childlike uh, have a sense of childlike wonder about this snowstorm and the uh, even essent beauty uh, of a snowstorm. And indeed, Cornell, one of the things he was always trying to do with his his collages and especially his boxes, his shadow boxes, was to capture uh, fleeting moments that uh, he wanted to trap in, in boxes. Um, I'm just gonna put the presentation on now and I'll talk over that. Let me just switch on to this. Yeah, so, I mean, in fact, you can see I put, I chose this uh, box by Cornell for the opening because of the, the setting we're in today. And you can just tell just by looking at this one box, this was a box actually done late in Cornell's life, but how his boxes are almost like children's toys or picture books that serve as entrees in, into dreams. Uh, when Cornell was uh, working in the New York art scene, he started in the 1930s, of course, we'll go into this today, but working right through into the 50s and 60s, uh, a lot of the New York art world looked at his work as uh, kind of syrupy, nostalgic, full of sentiment, and he was criticized for that. But uh, there was a whole other section of the art world that recognize the brilliance and the originality of this work. And we're gonna, we'll talk about that, that as well today. Um, I just wanna say a couple other things before I get into the body of the talk. Um, uh, being an uh, autodidact, Cornell, who had no, no formal training of any kind, would somehow manage to become one of the most original American artists of the 20th century. And as I just said, even though he didn't quite fit into the New York art scene, um, he was a lifelong bachelor. He lived with his mother and disabled brother in Queens. He um, was a practicing Christian scientist. Uh, he, he really didn't fit uh, clearly into the kind of hip New York scene. And yet, it, uh, it's like a who's who of the New York art world, people who revered him and his work and would visit his home in Queens, which we'll talk about as well a little later on. But what I want, I want to start here <clears throat> with this photograph of a young Cornell, that's Joseph Cornell in the background, 12 years, well, yeah, around 12 years old here, maybe a little younger. Uh, this photograph taken in the village of Nyack where Joseph Cornell spent his, his youth. As you probably know, so did Edward Hopper. Uh, that's a whole other story, which I won't have time to go into today. But this photograph was taken with Joseph and his younger brother, Robert, who's uh, seven years younger than uh, Joseph. And I want to reflect a little bit at the beginning of this talk on some of the experiences from Cornell's youth that deeply impacted him and his family. And we would go on to, um, to really uh, feed his work his, as an adult, his art as an adult. The first major tragedy in Cornell's life and for his, the Cornell family was that his brother Robert was born with cerebral palsy, uh, severely handicapped. And of course, this changed the family dynamic. And one of the things that happened is that Joseph immediately assumed the role of his brother's caretaker. 
and he would remain in that role for the rest of their lives. Uh, they would live together, and Joseph would take care of him until 1965. So this, this was a traumatic event for the family, and uh, it's, it really changed, of course, it changed Cornell uh, dramatically. This was the house, really, I think it's fair to call this an estate, possibly. This was one of the more lavish homes in, in uh, Nyack uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. This was on the upper uh, slopes of the Nyack Hill and Joseph Cornell's bedroom faced the Hudson River. So he had this kind of idyllic view of the village of Nyack, which was still very rural at that point, and the activity on the river. In fact, there are, uh, there are uh, references for both Cornell and Hopper, whose bedroom also faced the Hudson River. Uh, and they both were able to, uh, especially in the winter, and again, the perfect setting today, it was a very dreamlike setting that they would be able to look out their bedroom windows onto this magical landscape. And these years, that uh, early years that Cornell spent in this beautiful home were really the happiest years of his life. And he would say as much. And again, the memories um, and experiences he had at this early part of his life would feed his work uh, as an adult. His, his parents, uh, Joseph Sr. Jr. and his mother Helen, uh, I mean Joseph Sr., I'm sorry, and his mother Helen were both musical. Uh, Helen played the piano. They had two pianos in the house. There was always music going. The father was an amateur actor as well as a singer. And uh, they loved uh, popular opera of the time of the period, like Caruso, Gilbert Sullivan. Uh, so it was a very stimulating environment. And one of the other things that, the, that was, which I'm gonna focus on now, very pivotal, important experience for uh, young Joseph Cornell were the family trips into uh, Manhattan, into New York City. Oh, sorry, what's going on here? One second, I screwed up. Let me start here. Um, you know what, Cliff, while you fix that. Um, I got it. I've got a Why, couple, I got two questions and I just- Go I, ahead, go ahead. For answering, just because we're all sure. locals. I'm Everyone happy to wants go. to know if the house is still standing and it um, is. And it was it in isn't. South Nyack on Piermont Road, Piermont Avenue. No, 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 you're wrong. I am, okay. Yes. There are other houses standing. The Cornell family lived in a total of three homes. Ah, uh, okay, I'll let you tell This was the last house, and it was demolished to make way for the approachway onto the uh, Tappan Zee Bridge. So it does not exist anymore. Thank you, sorry about that, go ahead. No, that's okay. Is there another question or was that it? That was it, the peop I had two questions. That's the only way I wanted to bring it oh, up. Okay, okay. Yeah, please feel free. If you think it's a good question, I'd be more than happy to address it. Um, so one of the things that the Cornell family did was to make these uh, extensive trips into New York. Keep in mind, they had to take the train down into Jersey City. And then from Jersey City, I believe they took, I, I don't know if it was a ferry, I believe, but anyhow, it was a big deal. And one of the things they, they loved as a family was going to vaudeville shows. This is a photograph of the Palace Theater, which opened when Cornell was about seven years old and the family would go to the palace. And uh, vaudeville really started from, as you probably know, from sideshows really, but it uh, also incorporated uh, acts from Europe. So it had a little more sophistication than uh, circus sideshows. And there were continuous uh, re reviews. So there would be many acts in a vaudeville review. 
And what would happen, you would buy your ticket, uh, you would sit down, whatever act was on at the time, you would, you would start there and you could stay there and watch as many acts as you, as you wanted to. Um, they rank in like kind of a loop. So in fact, later in life, Cornell would say that literally he saw, he really viewed life itself as a collage. And the vaude, and vaudeville, the whole experience of vaudeville really did have elements of collage. It was these kind of incongruous acts uh, lumped together and uh, bits and pieces, kind of fragments, sh short performances. And these vaudeville acts, again, would left, leave a, a lasting mark on Cornell. And uh, it, there ev there's trace is evident in much of his work. I, I will only be able to go into a little bit today. One of the acts that was very popular. Uh, okay. Uh, one of the acts that was very popular at the palace at the time was uh, Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle Marzella's cockatoo act. And this is a good example of the European performers that were coming into New York to add a kind of international uh, sophisticated uh, flavor to the vaudeville. And uh, this is probably the first place that a young Joseph Cornell saw trained animal acts like this one. And you'll see in his work in later life how uh, fascinated he, he remained by parrots and, and cockatoos. And in fact, uh, Cornell, it's many scholars feel that Cornell viewed birds as symbols for women, that they shared feminine characteristics, especially songbirds to him were symbols of uh, singers uh, that he adored. Uh, so another thing that uh, another person that Cornell was exposed to as a very young boy was, was Houdini. And Houdini got to, uh, Cornell got to see Houdini perform at the Hippodrome. And the wonderment of observing Houdini escape, death-defying acts, as you all know, death-defying escapes from uh, boxes and chests were something that also stuck with him the rest of his life. In fact, uh, his work is all references to putting things in boxes. Deborah Solomon, his, uh, the foremost Cornell scholar, uh, at the, at living scholar, uh, had a great quote. She said, whereas Houdini escaped from boxes, eventually Cornell would escape into them. And that's really a great insight on Cornell. And in fact, as a young boy, uh, Houdini became one of his idols and he would practice, he learned to practice uh, magic and he would perform for his family and friends. He also got to see Houdini uh, perform one of his greatest illusions. And again, I say this because there is a, there is a direct connection between illusions and this, again, sense of childhood wonderment, seeing these kinds of amazing performances that Cornell would retain to an amazing degree. Uh, and I'll just say quickly a footnote on this because it is quite amazing in itself. Houdini did make a full grown elephant disappear in front of several hundred people at the Hippodrome. Um, the he actually had the elephant enter into like a small gypsy wagon and the wagon would be spun around and then Houdini would dramatically open the doors on both ends of the wagon so people could see completely through the wagon. And of course, Jenny was gone. Uh, still, it is still not known exactly how Houdini pulled this illusion off. It's had to involve mirrors, but other people have tried it and it has never worked quite the way Houdini was able to make it work. I mentioned this also because I'm going to show you a box later by Cornell. Once in a while, 
Cornell would incorporate mirrors to create illusions. And uh, so it's, it's, it's really deep connections here. Another place like many American families uh, in the New York area at the time loved was Coney Island, Luna Park in Coney Island, which was at its peak then. And uh, one, this ride pictured here was called Shoot the Shoot. And it was one of the more dangerous, uh, thrilling rides at Coney Island, along with the parachute jump. Um, and you can see from this photograph, this was literally in the, in the style of a roller coaster. This car would be uh, brought up on a cable all the way up this very steep high incline and then come down the other side, you know, released from the cable and just come down free, uh, unattached just on between these two rails. And you can even see that there's water uh, pouring down this uh, track as well. And what would happen at the end of this track, the end of the slope, the car would be thrust in the air and then plummet into a body of water. And it was a really, uh, you had to be, I'd say strong of spirit to go on this ride. Uh, I remember my parents talking about shoot the shoot. And I remember them specifically uh, commenting that eventually this ride was closed because uh, I, I know someone was either injured or killed on this ride. But these are the kinds of things that Cornell was experiencing with his family and would remain with him for the rest of his life. I mean, a lot of us experience things like this as children, uh, amusement parks with our families and whatnot. But for Cornell, uh, what distinguished him is that he never left this. These this these remained a part of his identity even as a, as a as a as a as an adult. But Cornell's favorite attractions at uh, Coney Island were the were the Penny Arcades, and again, Cornell would would always be fascinated with these uh, Penny Arcade slot machines. We see here a fortune telling machine. And there was something about the, the process of putting a coin in a slot, something happens. In this case, this uh, animated figure moves and there's a whole thing that happens. And then something comes out of a slot that you take with you. In this case, I guess it was a fortune. And uh, this concept would play a, a very strong role in some of the most original American art that's ever been created. Uh, and uh, we'll see that a little later. So this second major trauma that happens to Joseph and the Cornell family is the unexpected death of his father, seen here, Joseph Sr. of leukemia. And again, you saw they were living a pretty lavish lifestyle. Uh, and what happens tragically, when Joseph's father dies, uh, his mother finds out that he was in tremendous debt. Turns out he had quite a lavish lifestyle, gambling, activities that the family had no idea about uh, because he was involved in textile sales and he was a textile designer. So he did go on trips, sales trips and things like that. And apparently he was doing things that the family just had no knowledge of. So he left the family in significant debt and uh, unfortunately, the mother had to sell their home uh, shortly after. And that was the game changer for the Cornell family. And at that point, the mother uh, moves the family to Queens. Uh, and they live in much more, uh, a much reduced lifestyle for the rest of their lives. They rent various apartments. They eventually... Uh, in uh, the 1930s, they purchase a home on Utopia Parkway, Queens. And that's the house that they, that Joseph, uh, his mother and his brother will remain in for the rest of their days. And I did forget to mention, and this is, I, I, I'm sorry about this, but 
Cornell also had two younger sisters, uh, Betty and Helen. Um, they would eventually go out, go on to their own lives, but uh, Cornell would remain the caretaker of his younger brother. So shortly after the death of Cornell's father, Cornell's mother, Helen, uses her connections with the owners of the textile company that uh, her, her husband had worked for, for for many years, had been very, had brought the company much success. And apparently they treat the, they, they take on responsibility for the Cornell family, which is very interesting. And uh, Helen Cornell is able to get uh, the folks at the textile company to finagle something and they get a young Joseph admitted into a very elite boarding school in uh, Andover, Massachusetts, the Phillips Academy. So uh, Joseph leaves for high school at the Phillips Academy. This, is, this will be the first and only time that Joseph Cornell leaves New York and leaves his family. The first and only time. And Cornell does not fare well at the Phillips Academy. He does poorly academically. Uh, the only subject he, he does well in, and it it's, uh, begins a lifelong interest in, in French literature for him, is, is French literature. And he will go on in his life to adore anything French um, and be quite, become quite an expert on French uh, culture in general. But uh, unfortunately, he doesn't fit into the athletic uh, scene at the school, and he's very unhappy there. And he, in his fourth year, he doesn't he doesn't finish. He does he's not able to complete his uh, his grades. He doesn't have enough uh, credits to graduate, and he leaves Phillips without any uh, any diploma, without graduating. And he comes back to his family in Queens where he will remain for the rest of his life. So when he comes back to Queens, uh, young Cornell in his early 20s, again, his mother using the connections with the textile company in Manhattan, gets young Joseph a job as a traveling salesman uh, for textiles and his territory is New York City. Cornell hates this job. He's ill-suited for it. He doesn't like it, but he will do it uh, for the next close to 20 years in various, uh, he does, he is promoted eventually to into more of a design capacity, but he remains in this kind of a day job for uh, a, almost 20 years. The good, the good side of this is that when Cornell's not making his sales calls, he becomes absolutely, uh, fascinated with the New York City of the 1920s, every aspect of it. He becomes an opera buff, he frequents ballet, he goes to art galleries, and what's interesting about Cornell and will make him unique as a New York artist, he also loves the penny arcades and movie theaters in Times Square, and he haunts these, which were very prevalent in New York City at the time, outdoor bookstalls. And these bookstalls not only sold uh, 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 printed objects, books and printed objects, but they also sold uh, photographs uh, and other items. For example, uh, Joseph would build a serious collection, not only of books, but of uh, maps, uh, including constellation maps, uh, lunar maps. He uh, collected movie stills, especially of uh, the movie stars that he adored. Uh, and also he even collected film canisters, 35 millimeter film canisters, which at the time had no real uh, value. Um, and he would go on to, to, to make some very important ex work in experimental film with film collage which I will not have the time to go into today, unfortunately. It's one of my favorite aspects of Cornell's work. But uh, 
It's a day in 1931, which is the pivotal point for Cornell as an artist. Up until this time, Cornell has become, as I say, a serious collector. He has collections of various uh, printed material and uh, visual materials archived in his home. His collection will eventually become so uh, significant that curators from New York museums will approach him to borrow pieces from his collection. But in 1931, he walks into this gallery on 57th Street, the Julian Levy Gallery. And uh, just coincidentally, the show that's uh, up is a show of Max Ernst's uh, first paper collages. Now, L Levy was a, uh, a gallerist who was one of the first to highlight not only modernists from Europe like Picasso, but also the surrealists, including Marcel Duchamp, Salvador Dali, uh, who else am I trying to think of right now? Uh, and others have escaped me at the moment. But uh, so he was essentially a surrealist gallery and also very in interesting, amazing coincidence that neither Levy or Cornell knew at the time, they were both practicing Christian scientists. So what happens is uh, Cornell is startled by this exhibition. This is one of the paper collages by the German surrealist Max Ernst that was featured in this show in 1931. It was part of about 100 illustrations that were made from steel engravings. And uh, this was part of an early project by Ernst called his collage novel, which is obviously way ahead of its time. This is an epiphany for Cornell, seeing these paper collages. Because again, Cornell, who has absolutely no formal training of his own, doesn't know how to paint, draw, sculpt, anything, he realizes that he could do this. And not only could he do this, but he has the material at home. He has vast examples of these illustrations made from uh, steel engravings, which is a new technique for for making reproductions in books. And uh, he immediately goes home to his you know, house in Queens. And after his family goes to bed, after he's done work at night, he starts to sit down at the kitchen table and make his first art, his first paper collages. This is the first paper collage that Cornell made um, in that same year, 1931. And he would do several of these. He would put together a little portfolio of these paper collages. And he immediately brought them in to show Julian Levy. And Levy loved them. He thought they were great. Um, and he actually offers Cornell the opportunity to exhibit these in the gallery. This is truly one of these moments when Cornell's life takes on fairy tale qualities. And so for Cornell's first exhibit, he's never made art in his life, his first exhibit in a major gallery on 57th Street, which was the art center of, of New York at the time, is showing his work along with Picasso, Marcel Duchamp, Salvador Dali, and, and others. Absolutely astounding story. And because of this, Cornell starts to be, build relationships with some of the artists that Levy works with, uh, most importantly, Marcel Duchamp. Now, another jump here, in 1936, Cornell has his second major leap in his career, opportunity, amazing opportunity. The Museum of Modern Art, 1936, <clears throat> is planning their first major exhibition on surrealist and, and uh, surrealist art and fantasy. And Levy recommends that they include at least one piece by Cornell, and they do. This piece is called, uh, excuse me, Soap, Soap Bubble Set. And this is Cornell's first shadow box. This is a new form of art, really, uh, taking the box, the simple wooden box, and making it into a, a form of high art. And just a couple things I want to just show you on this box quickly. Uh, 
one of the things that Cornell's featuring this box is this white clay or Dutch clay pipe. And at this point, Cornell has a collection of Dutch clay pipes. He is of Dutch ancestry himself, and he's very keyed into his Dutch heritage. But here, Cornell is taking the Dutch pipe, which is used as a tobacco pipe, and he's translating it into a children's item. And he's used one of his antique lunar maps here to symbolize the bubble. So again, we go into a child's world, a child's uh, sense of imagination and wonder about the natural world. He's also taken a bird's egg here, which he will use throughout uh, his, his life and his work to symbolize life, among other things. And notice here he's selected a, for this sculpture or this head, he's selected not an adult head, but a child's head, which he's put on a pedestal. And again, this work is about the sanctity, the nobility of children. And this was of high importance to Cornell. And these four wooden cylindrical objects have many different interpretations about this. Some believe they are standing in for Cornell and his siblings, but they also simply reveal, they look like uh, children's toys again of some kind. Uh, so one of the things I wanna say quickly about this box, Cornell also never used a tool in his life. So he had to struggle to figure out how to make these boxes. And one, the story that I've learned is that uh, Cornell's next door neighbor in Queens, his name was Carl Backman. Carl Backman was a working class guy and he had a wood shop in his basement. And Cornell apparently approached Backman and asked him for help making boxes. And Backman would assist him for the next five or six years until Cornell became very good at it and would make some amazing boxes, which I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, eventually, Cornell would reward Backman with a couple of boxes as gifts. So where did Cornell get the idea? What was the inspiration for taking boxes, wooden boxes, and making them into uh, kind of uh, uh, into objects of fine art? It's almost like dioramas. Well. One possibility is that Cornell loved to go to the Museum of Natural History. You know, he was constantly looking through wooden showcases, glass panes with dioramas inside of natural scenes. Another clear influence, maybe the spark that gave Cornell the idea was Marcel Duchamp, who I, as I explained, they had become friends. They both were represented by Levy. And Duchamp uh, in 1935, just before Cornell would make his first box for the Museum of Modern Art, started to construct what he called these museums in a box, which featured printed reproductions of his own work set up as a traveling salesman's sample case. There's, that's a funny coincidence too, right? Um, and he asked, Cornell to a system of making reproductions so he could sell them and make some money. So this is very possibly where this idea sparked for Cornell, although he would never admit to this on record. Um, another source as I as the connection with the traveling salesman's sample cases. You know, uh, Cornell had a case something like this that he was schlepping around uh, New York City. And did the idea occur to him? Did he see this box in some kind of magical way that you and I may not see? Was this the original spark for his boxes? We don't know. Cornell himself would say that it happened by just his endless walks in New York City looking into store windows. And this, I'm just showing you a window from 1920s New York here. And you could see how this could possibly have sparked Cornell's idea that again, he's looking through glass onto this almost surrealist, uh, incongruous collection of objects um, that he was connecting in his mind. Uh, he said himself, he, was look, he walked in 
he walked past one store that had beautiful compasses in the window. He looked at the next store window and they had these beautiful uh, cigar boxes. And he put the two together and he claimed that's where the first inspirational moment came. So we see here one of these wonderful boxes. This one was, uh, this is called Forgotten Game. Cornell made this in 1949. This is a, one of my favorite pieces by Cornell. It's a wonderful example of how he's incorporated these memories and his love of these penny arcade slot machines. You can see that right here, you lift this tab and you put a wooden ball in and Cornell has created a number of chutes, glass chutes, which run down this box like shoot the shoot. And at the very bottom, you see the balls appear in this little glass panel, and then they come out this door. Um, and he's also influenced here, by the way, from the arcade peep shows, uh, where you looked through a viewer in through a hole and saw some kind of scene or image. So this, is, this, this box is actually a reference to both the uh, slot machines and the peep show machines. And uh, another thing I just want to point out quickly about this box, we see he's featured a number of birds in the windows, again, reference to the natural world. And it has this antique look, this object looks ancient. And Cornell very cleverly achieved this effect by literally coating these boxes with many coats of enamel paint, which he would let completely dry. And then he would literally put them in the kitchen oven and bake them. And toast them essentially to get this this antique look so this again this is an actual uh, penny arcade slot machine from that period which cornell was endlessly looking at fascinated by and here's another one of his boxes referenced by these slot machines slash peep show machines and uh Interestingly enough, what is this piece called by Cornell? Done in, uh, this was done in, sorry, 1941. What's the name? Swiss Shoot the Shoot. So again, he was directly referencing his childhood experiences at Coney Island. And one more example I wanted to give. These, this is a interesting, this is also a slot machine, a variation on the slot machines. This was not in a penny arcade. But these uh, slot machines were used to dispense items. In this case, I believe gum, gum balls. Sometimes they dispensed marbles and other things. And these were put out throughout. These were uh, displayed throughout the New York subway system, which Cornell used every day. And they even were put in some drug stores and other retail stores. And these things all caught Cornell's attention and were inspiration for his very, very original American art. This is one of his, considered one of his masterpieces. <clears throat> Excuse me. Medici slot machine. And um, again, we see a, at this point, a very well-crafted box, very complex. Now he's using tinted glass. He's etching glass. He's um, incorporating doors and drawers. But this piece thematically includes, again, he's focused on Medici prints, but take note, it's not an adult prints, it's a child prints. And one of the first examples on these side panels here, where Cornell is directly referencing cinema, film strips. He's probably the first American artist to do so. And it's this interesting blend of high and low culture that uh, distinguishes Cornell's work and would influence the pop art movement. Uh, in fact, Cornell was referred to as the grandfather of pop art. And then notice on the bottom, this section, this compartment here on the bottom, and what is Cornell included here? Again, more childhood objects from literally the five and dime stores something else new and fine art at the time, uh, building blocks, a marble, and also a, an item he would use over and over in his, his boxes, 
these steel springs from watches that uh, were sometimes used to symbolize time and other, and other things. So this is a uh, typical newsstand, magazine stand in the 1930s in New York. And uh, Cornell was, again, probably the first New York artist to recognize the beauty of these magazines and uh, the celebrities. And Cornell had no reservation. Cornell was a completely intuitive artist. He had no commercial aspirations. He had no interest in whether he made money or didn't make money. He really didn't seem to care. Uh, he's making poetry. It was really from his soul. And he had no reservation to taking these printed images of these beautiful movie stars and incorporating them into his fine art. There was no issue for him. So Cornell, who had uh, very Victorian values, I think I mentioned he was a lifelong bachelor and he really did have, he was very shy, painfully shy with women. And he never really established a, a real deep relationship with a woman in his life, but he admired women from afar, especially these beautiful movie stars and opera singers, ballet dancers. This is a, uh, so what he would do is he would build collages or boxes for these women that he admired and send them to them, hoping that I would open a door and uh, to some kind of relationship with them. This is the piece that he literally sent to Greta Garbo and uh, Greta Garbo was totally put off by it and immediately returned it to him and said, you know, don't bother me. Uh, I'm not interested kind of thing. And that was the case most of the time. He did one for Fay Ray, uh, oh God, Audrey Hepburn, I think many, many famous uh, movie stars. And most of them rejected him or, and the boxes. But this box, which I think is one of Cornell's masterpieces called um, <clears throat> Penny Arcade Portrait of Laura McCall done in 1945. And you talk about an intricate box. Look at the work that Cornell did on this piece. Um, and again, it incorporates the same features, the um, slot at the top where you put in this wooden ball, which would go down a series of chutes, which you could see going through behind these blue tinted glass panes, which were also etched, and then come down to this bottom compartment and out the door. Um, and he literally cut out these photographs of Lauren Picall from like Photo Play magazine or something like that. And again, these side panels and this top panel reference cinema, film strips. He offered this box, I believe the story goes that he offered this box to Laura McCall at the time and she turned it down and later in life, it was one of her biggest regrets in life that she did not accept Cornell's box, which she learned to love and finally appreciate, not to mention its value, uh, eventual value. But uh, I don't know, I don't know if you can hear this, if you're getting the sound, but I'm trying to give you a sense that not only was it a, a visual experience, but these boxes had a, a sound quality as well, like a slot machine. So another thing I want to talk about quickly today, because I'm sure I'm running long already here, uh, is uh, Cornell's great reverence for the natural world. And this is a, uh, a scene from Queens, believe it or not, not too far from where Cornell lived. And Cornell would take his bicycle and make these trips out to these colonial homes, colonial, homes from the colonial period, and interestingly enough, Queens originally was a Dutch settlement. And uh, Cornell would go out and visit these Dutch homes from, from the colonial period. And he would sp spend hours uh, collecting things that he could find that were around the, around the houses, uh, pieces of bark, uh, whatever it was, he could find things, nests, bark, um, and bring them back to his workshop, which he now was working in his basement as well, and make boxes that were kind of an homage to the, to the natural world, which apparently Cornell 
was very sensitive to the fact that it was also had this uh, uh, changing quality uh, that this beautiful, this rural beauty in Queens was not for long, that it would be replaced by development. And Cornell was aware of that and very disturbed by it. And again, much of his work that pays tribute to the natural world is uh, kind of a, 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 a response to this problem that he, he anticipates. Um, I want to just quickly show this box because Cornell rarely incorporated architecture or elements of architecture into his work, very unusual. He only did a couple of these. And this is called Setting for a Fairy Tale. Again, this childlike sensibility. And uh, this is one of the boxes where Cornell, in the back of this uh, is the mirror. So you're seeing yourself as you look at this, this uh, Renaissance uh, estate. And he's taken these branches, of course, from uh, one of these properties that I just showed to you. Um, and it does have a fairy tale quality to it. Uh, and it, it's, again, it's a magical quality, the mirrors, things that Cornell never got over as a, as a child. And also one of the things I did wanna say quickly about this box, which fascinates me, by the way, it's one of the only boxes I've seen of Cornell's at the Whitney Museum. I don't know how many they have, but I rarely see any of Cornell's work at the Whitney, which shocks me. I did see this one there, um, but it also made me wonder if there was some kind of reference to Cornell's early years in that beautiful, almost mansion that he lived in as a child. So one of the other uh, important bodies of Cornell's work are his his aviaries, his, the, the, the boxes that feature birds. He constantly used birds as the surrealists did as symbols for various things. And this, but this box, uh, simple box with a night owl in it. Uh, I, I'm sorry, is it a night owl? Barn owl, I believe, whatever. Um, again, you can see many of these elements that Cornell has collected from his trips on his bicycle. And this is literally a cutout of a paper image from some magazine of an owl. Um, these are beautiful, beautiful pieces. Uh, this piece, just to show you again, how many important artists in New York were on to, to Cornell and appreciated him before the rest of the world did. This, this box Jasper Johns bought uh, and it's still in Jasper Johns personal collection. This, uh, these slides of owls, I'm showing you these snowy owls, I'm showing you for a reason. These slides were used with <clears throat> a device that Joseph Cornell's father had given to his sister Betty as a child, but it eventually wound up in Joseph's collection. It was called a stereo uh, optagon, which was invented for the, uh, I think the 1937 Paris World's Fair. And when, here is the viewer, and when you look through it, um, it combines these two images to make one three-dimensional image. And I show you that because again, going back to these early slides that Cornell had as a boy, as a young boy from his father and how they played a role in his later work with his owls. Another important piece by Cornell. This is an amazing, amazing piece. Uh, this is called, uh, this is, oh boy. Uh, I think it's the, uh, yeah, the, the shooting gallery. I, this was done in the 40s, but what I wanted to say about this piece is amazing piece. This is one of the few pieces by Cornell, one of the few boxes where he is uh, showing distress. Uh, there's violence. Cornell rarely shows violence in his, in his work. But if you can see, this, the only one of this, the, the only time he did this, he literally cracked the glass, shattered the glass. And at the heart is this uh, very uh, expressionistic uh, red blob of paint. And this, he's clearly uh, showing the plight of these parrots and cockatoos in the context of how he was seeing them 
uh, as shooting gallery targets and how birds were regarded by our, by our society, by our modern society. A remarkable piece. Um, and in one more, I want to show another bird box here. And this, this box, although very simple, uh, was done later in the, in the 1950s by Cornell. Again, it, it strongly shows the bird trapped in this cage. And again, we see the use of the steel spring as a symbol for time, most likely. Um, and what I wanted to share with you is this drawer on this box. Now, Cornell would include drawers, secret compartments on the box, and they would often contain other objects that would suggest other mysteries that you had no idea what he was, what he was trying to say. <clears throat> but in the box, in this particular, in the drawer, in this particular box, when you opened it up, what was in it was this toy uh, plastic action figure of an Indian. And again, indicating that Cornell was concerned about the plight, not only of the natural world in, in, in uh, Queens, but what happened to the indigenous tribes that were part of Queens at one time. So he was always putting these little clues and little messages, comments in various compartments and drawers in his boxes. Now this is a still, unfortunately I was not able to get into his experimental film work, uh, which I, I, I like to do, but it presents problems, first of all, with Zoom technology. Uh, but this is from Nymph Flight, which was uh, done uh, in the 1960s. And again, shot in Bryant Park, a series almost like a short collage film. But again, uh, he was fascinated by the simplest events in New York City. Uh, this this uh, short collage film features pigeons. It's, it's, uh, he, he, he loved pigeons. Um, they, they were, even though they're considered these very marginal birds, they're not given much respect. Uh, Cornell did uh, really admire them and saw really beautiful qualities in pigeons. Um, I'm just gonna read a quick line from a Wallace Stevens poem, Sunday morning, which I think is appropriate. Another shows the reverence for pigeons, which goes very well with this image. Quote, uh, casual flocks of pigeons that make ambiguous undulations as they sink downward to darkness on extended wings. So I love the, the, the uh, respect for the most humble creatures and Cornell really was a very sensitive soul in that respect. Another, this is one of my favorite boxes. This is a, from a series of boxes he did in the mid 1940s called the, the GC44 series. And that stood for Garden Center 1944 because Cornell actually worked uh, as a laborer in a, in a plant nursery uh, near his home for the summer of 1944. And this was partially because the owner of the nursery was also a, a fellow Christian scientist who was helping his brother, Robert. And I think as a favor, Cornell worked there for a summer and he actually found it very interesting. And he kept extensive notebooks of everything he was seeing and experiencing in this simple plant nursery, garden nursery in Queens. And these books would wind up, he would keep making entries into these journals from 1944 right through the 1960s. Uh, and this is one of these images of rabbits, which again, many, a lot of uh, people in the New York art world had trouble with this work. You know, what is more sentimental than a bunny rabbit? But Cornell didn't care about that. Uh, again, he was keying into that childlike wonder. And his brother, Robert, uh, also loved rabbits. And so he's paying a kind of tribute to his brother here. Um, so just to give you a context of this, this, are, this is a photo of ceramic rabbits that Cornell purchased at the garden center that he put in his own backyard in this, that had this childlike uh, quality. 
And here's a photo of Cornell late in life with these ceramic uh, bunny rabbits. Um, so to say that Cornell was in touch with his inner child is a vast uh, understatement. This is one of these, uh, Cornell would also visit the, the beaches near his, in Queens and collect natural objects from the beach, including starfish you see in sand, bring them back and make these sand boxes. And these were kind of worked like etch-a-sketches where when you move the box, you know, the sand would shift. It had, it had a, a kinetic quality to it. Uh, these simple boxes that many people would dismiss as sentimental nonsense, Marcel Duchamp loved them. He purchased two of them. And uh, he owned a few of Cornell's uh, boxes. You cannot get a higher compliment than that. Uh, this box right now, I believe, is still in the private collection of, of uh, Marcel Duchamp's, it was in his collection of his widow. I don't know if his uh, wife is, was, is still alive, his former wife, but it is in the family collection. And one more of these boxes where you can see some of the driftwood and rocks and shells that Cornell would collect from the beach and also one of his constellation maps and these metal rings and bars, which some people theorize are again references to Houdini. They can all be, also be symbols for planets or uh, celestial bodies, objects. Um, but notice these kind of threatening nails that he's included in this piece. Very interesting, mysterious pieces. Again, the eggs in glasses that he's purchased at the local five and dime store. Um, and where did Cornell, uh, you'll see a lot of his work, which I don't have time to show you today. He incorporates constellations. He loves the stars. He's endlessly looking at constellation maps and incorporating them in his pieces. What were some of the stimuli for Cornell's use of constellations? And one idea I've had, which I've never read anywhere, Cornell every day coming from, traveling from Queens into New York would take the train. He'd get out in Grand Central Station. And I can't help but wonder if, you know, those, that ceiling, that miraculous ceiling in Grand Central Station strongly influenced Cornell and, and his work. Um, this is, uh, again, I've, I've talked about this, this simple house they lived in in, in in Queens on Utopia Parkway. This is a rare photograph of Cornell in the house listening to opera or, or music. Uh, and uh, what, the reason I'm showing you these is that uh, one of the things I really want to point out is that Cornell didn't make any money really from his art. Uh, he couldn't quit his day job, so to speak, until 1939, when he was already, I think, in his 50s. And he never made art for money. He had trouble selling his art. He had trouble parting with his art. And at times, he would keep it in his garage. And at this point, these boxes were worth a lot of money. But he wouldn't sell a box to a person that he didn't feel had the right intent. Uh, and he uh, lived this very simple lifestyle. Even after he was an internationally known artist and had a one person show at the Guggenheim, he didn't change any aspect of his personal life. This is a photograph of his bedroom. And this is how simply almost a monk life like existence even at the, at the peak of his success and uh, fame. And this is a photograph, rare photograph of, of his workshop in the basement where he made his boxes. And uh, various uh, celebrities would come to the house, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, uh, to visit Cornell. And, uh, but one thing, one honor they would almost never be paid is to be invited down to his cellar workshop. If anyone came to the house, no matter how famous, they would be served soft drinks and cookies uh, or some kind of sweet on the front porch of the house and maybe get invited into the kitchen or living room, but never into the cellar. And one more shot from Cornell's basement. 
of his basement window here. He never changed any of this and uh, lived this way his entire life. One more rare photograph of uh, Cornell in the garage uh, where he kept dozens of boxes. Eventually there was a scandal because one of the young women, a waitress at a coffee shop off Bryant Park where he would uh, be all the time they had a crush on, uh, eventually would steal about a dozen boxes from this garage. And Cornell being such a gentleman, gentle soul, he would refuse to press charges against this young woman. So this is the house, Utopia Parkway, that Cornell and his mother and his disabled brother Robert would live in for their entire lives. Robert would live until 1965. The mother died a year later. And that was really the beginning of the decline for Joseph as well. But this simple house in Queens um, was the go-to spot for any New York artist that knew about Cornell. And there were many. Uh, Tony Curtis was an enormous fan of Joseph Cornell, had aspirations to be a fine artist himself, and uh, was visited the Cornell house anytime he was in New York making a film. Eventually, Curtis would make the mistake of creating his own shadow box and thinking it would flatter uh, Cornell. It did. Cornell was very insulted that he would do that and would never speak to Tony Curtis again, would never let him in the house again. Uh, again, I mentioned several times to the talk, a friend and a fellow artist, Marcel Duchamp, would often visit the house with his wife. And uh, he, work. he loved seeing what he was working. And again, I mentioned he purchased about, I think three or four of Cornell's boxes, which he treasured. Another, uh, one of the few women, celebrity women that Cornell managed to crack and built a kind of relationship with was Susan Sontag. He originally seen her picture on the book, uh, the author's you know, picture photograph. And he immediately made a collage for her, sent it to her apartment on, the, uh, on Riverside Drive. And uh, she accepted it. And she became very interested in him and his work and wrote about his work, thought he was a brilliant artist, but she was a little nervous around him and would never go to the house alone. She would always come chaperoned either with her son or someone else. And I will say one more thing about this with Susan Sontag. As far as I know, Susan Sontag was the only person invited down into uh, Cornell's stellar workshop, the highest honor you could, you could have from Cornell. And yes, another visitor and admirer was Andy Warhol. And uh, definitely Warhol was directly influenced by uh, Cornell. There's absolutely no doubt. And one of the interesting parallels between Warhol and Cornell is that uh, even though Warhol has this kind of uh, bad boy image, which he was, but let's not forget that Warhol also lived with his mother and took care of her uh, until she passed away. Um, but yes, he used to visit the house in Queens and like everybody else, he would be served soft drinks and some kind of cookie or something on the porch. And that was it. Um, one other couple that uh, visited the house was uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Yoko Ono was the one who knew about Cornell. She really educated Lennon about uh, Cornell's work. And um, of course, uh, Yoko Ono was part of the 1950s New York art movement, the Nexus movement. And uh, they went to Cornell's house, I think a couple of times, few times. And the story, I don't know if it's 100% true, but the story goes that uh, one of the reasons that Cornell liked them is that Yoko Ono would come wearing see-through blouses. And, uh, but when they tried to purchase boxes from Cornell, he wouldn't sell them a box. I'm not sure exactly why, but it seems like he would not sell them a box. And interestingly enough, they. The story is that they literally had, they found out about Carl Bachman, who had, Cornell had given him a couple of boxes as a gift for his services. 
and they were able to purchase a couple of boxes from Carl Backman. They did buy a number of collages. He would sell them collages, but for whatever reasons, they couldn't get a box from him. And most, maybe most importantly, I want to mention uh, uh, this figure, Yayoi uh, Kasama, uh, Japanese artist also, who was part of the Nexus group with Yoko Ono. And of all the women that uh, Cornell knew and admired, um, uh, Kasama was the only one that got involved with Cornell. Uh, she would spend days at the house. She didn't get along with the mother, no surprise, domineering mother. But they were very, very close. They admired each other deeply as artists and, and shared similar visions. And it's kind of a beautiful uh, story. And um, I wanted to kind of end this on this kind of positive romantic note. This is a drawing, one of the few drawings that we have of Cornell's that he did of uh, Kasama. Um, and uh, he gave it to her, he would give her these pieces. Here's another collage that Cornell gave to Kasama in the 1960s. Uh, she would claim later in life that their relationship was platonic, but that they were deeply connected as artists and as, as kind of kindred souls. Maybe the closest to a real romance that, that Cornell came to. Um, so I want to end this. I was in, a, my wife and I were trying to remember if it was the Pace Gallery. I'm not 100% certain, but last year we were in a gallery in Chelsea and uh, we stumbled upon the work of uh, uh, Yayoi Kasama uh, accidentally, a small show of her, some of her work. This is her. She is now eight, she's 91. She's still alive, still making art, we see here in Japan. And interestingly enough, she um, talks about Cornell uh, and still has strong memories of Cornell's art and his spirit and kept all the artwork that Cornell gave to her and uh, many of the objects and artifacts that were kind of just given as, you know, uh, little trinkets that she has everything. Um, a very interesting, beautiful connection between these two artists. And the more you look at Kasama's work and Cornell's work, you can see how they, she may have been strongly influenced by him or they influenced each other, I don't know. But this is one of these pieces, collages that I saw, that my wife and I saw in, in, uh, in, in Chelsea last year, uh, which shocked me. I had never seen these. Uh, this is done, it's called the Nest. Uh, how much, you know, queen I like can you get? This was done in the 1980s by Kasama. And I thought these were beautiful little collages. Um, and one more here I wanted to share with you, which is called The Red Bird by uh, Kasama, done in 1981 as well. Clearly, uh, maybe a homage to Cornell or whatever, but I wanted to end on that positive note. So, Veronica, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it here. We can go into any questions or comments or anything, if anybody has anything. Well